Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the reading of complex nonfiction and how we can help kids to do it better. Uh, and I'm going to be referring a lot to this whole notion of expertise and equity. Um, let me see if I can get this thing to work. Yes, excellent. Okay, so just a little bit about myself. Uh, to piggyback on what Amelia said, I've been teaching for 34 years and I feel like I'm doing it more and more and more with a sense of, of urgency. Uh, I am teaching in Boise, Idaho, and we've welcomed 12,000 refugee families in the last 10 years. Yeah, who knew? I mean, it's one of the great refugee cities of the world, and it's rare that you would fly into Boise and not be with a family with notes pinned to their coats, you know, saying, please deliver me to. Um, there's over 100 languages in the two schools where I work. Um, and these kids have often been in war-torn situations. We have a lot of, for instance, Syri Syrian refugees, a lot of kids from the Balkans, a lot of kids from Southeast Asia. What kid doesn't need to be a better reader? What kid doesn't need to be integrated into the culture? What kid doesn't need to be heard and known and to be part of the community? So I'm finding myself teaching more and more with a great sense of urgency. Throughout my 34 years of teaching, I've been dedicated to helping struggling students to productively struggle, particularly with reading. Uh, and this, you know, and I'm 34 years into it and I'm still learning a lot every day. And what I'm, who I'm learning from is the kids. They're the ones that teach me how they need to be helped and to assist them. Notice that I didn't say that I want to alleviate struggle. Struggle is part of learning. I try to reframe the struggle for the kids and say, you know, when you made that error, that wasn't an error, that was a sign of growth. Because you tried to do something you couldn't do yet. And that's what you have to do to get better. You can't learn a foreign language, you can't learn English if you're in EL unless you're willing to take the risk and struggle. And you know, what's interesting to me is that, is how school, again to uptake Amelia, often gives the wrong invitations. Because what is it that we tend to mark on student papers and tests? The errors. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's motivating. Mm -hmm. If I went home every night and my wife had a list of all my shortcomings as a husband, I'd be psyched to be married. <laughs> yeah, but what if we could name for kids what they were doing and the meaning and effect of that? And what they could do next? and the meaning and effect of that. That'd be a totally different reorientation from a deficit mindset to a growth mindset. And a realization that errors or falling short are a necessary part of growth, so they need to be celebrated. <coughs> now, I was, I was giving a speech at the Illinois Reading Council a couple weeks ago, and after my speech I sat down and people were talking about what they'd gotten from the speech. And I was kind of interested that I didn't make my major point to them. So I, I'm going to play the old preacher here. I'm going to tell you what my major point is. And then I'm going to tell you what my major point is. I'm going to tell you what I told you, all right? So you don't miss it. So, yes, throughout my years of being a researcher, from you got to be in a book, to my current research, on uh, helping kids be better readers of nonfiction. I have been saying these things, that this is all true. I would argue that motivation and engagement are of prerequisite importance. You know, the literacy is a set of profound cognitive outcomes. The, the next generation standards worldwide are profound cognitive outcomes. And you're not going to get kids to achieve those things unless they are motivated and engaged. And the linchpin of motivation is the growth mindset and a sense of confidence. You need to believe that with effort, practicing expert strategies, you will get better. And you need assistance to do those things. The, the research from Carol Dweck and Peter Johnson and people like that on this is <coughs> profound. If we promote the growth mindset, we've given the kids a gift that keeps on giving throughout their lives. Because in fact, it is practice with expert strategies that leads to expertise. Anders Ericsson's research has made that very clear. He's the guy who uh, Malcolm Gladwell made famous with the 10,000 hours of practice to expertise. 
Uh, and actually, Anders Ericsson said he got it so wrong that he's written a book to correct him. Uh, because what Ericsson found was you need 3,000 hours of a particular kind of practice within a 10 year period to become merely competent with an expert repertoire like reading or writing. And the kind of practice you need, he called deliberate focused practice. In other words, you can practice 3,000 hours and still suffer. You need to practice the way experts practice. You need to need what's called the correspondence concept. You need to do things that experts do. You need to meet the real reader test or the real writer test. A lot of things we do in school have no effect. That they're not they're not corresponding to expertise. I could give you a lot of really embarrassing examples from my own teaching life. I don't want to do that, so I'll give you a small one. For many years, I taught my middle school and high school students not to split infinitives. And I marked it off in my writing. Take down your favorite author, read 10 pages, she's splitting infinitives. There are things you cannot possibly express in English unless you split infinitives. So, by teaching that and grading it off, I was actually making my students stupider. I was moving them away from expertise and towards not being an expert. So we really have to have this as a rule. What is the real reader test? And how are you giving kids deliberate, focused practice on those particular strategies? So, wow, I went on a total rip. So, yes, I am saying that motivation and engagement are a prerequisite of importance, for sure. And that we need to get kids reading a lot, for sure. And that choice is important. That exciting materials matching kids' interests must be immediately available, right there in the classroom. And that teachers and peers must provide repeated invitations for engaging matches. This is all true. But I'm also saying much more. <laughs> yes, Gesundheit. I'm saying reading is a civil right. And that we must consciously and actively and explicitly teach our students the strategies that experts use and the stances that experts use. We need to teach them how to read and write and problem solve if we want our students to access this civil right. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this and the principles behind it, and then the rest of my talk is going to be very practical about what we can do. In my study, We Need No Fix No Chevys, we found that the central linchpin of motivation, the central explanatory factor of why boys chose to do what they love to do, and why they avoided what they avoided, and this was true of literacy and all other activities, was confidence. As one boy said, and he could have provided a mantra, I just like being good at it. And we found that everything the boys loved to do was explained by either they were already good at it, or they were getting visible signs of accomplishment. They could see how they were getting better. And that was highly, highly motivating. Uh, they also liked a functional application because that shows you that you've learned something that you can use in the world. And the more non-mainstream the kid, the more struggling the kid, the more that was important. They wanted to see an immediate application, an immediate functional value. And I'm talking immediate, and I'm talking functional. One boy said, school teaches you never for who you really are today, but who they want you to be tomorrow. Kids live in the present moment. They want to be helped to do something today. One of the boys in the study said, um, reading is about nothing. It doesn't help you do anything. It's about rhythm and commas and crap like that for God's sake. I don't you do anything. Now notice, I mean, you hurt my feelings. I've been doing it for 34 years. But he wasn't talking reading. He was talking to reading class. And what he wanted what was something was if you could immediately apply. And they didn't construe application narrowly. It was like if you could think with it, argue with it, talk about it, that was functional enough. But they wanted those visible signs of accomplishment. You could talk about it, that was a sign of accomplishment. When you could use it, that was a sign of accomplishment. And they demanded that they get assisted through the struggle. One boy said, it's like the teacher takes you out, throws you in the deep in the pool, waits to see if you drown, and then marks it down in a grave book. <laughs> and he wasn't being critical of being thrown in the deep end of the pool. He was being critical, give me the help I need. 
in, in fact, why didn't you teach me to swim before you threw me in the deep end of the pool? Why didn't you prepare me for success instead of having to remediate me? So they wanted to be assistant, assisted. They wanted to be assured that they were going to get the assistance they needed to meet the struggle. And when they felt that assurance, they would take on big challenges. Now, here's my favorite new study. And when I was finishing my book, Reading Unbound, about uh, my research into the power of pleasure reading, we came across the latest analysis of the British cohort study. And we actually stopped the presses so we could add this to our book, Reading Unbound. The power of uh, pleasure comes out of this British cohort study. The British love these kind of studies, longitudinal studies. I don't know if you know the, uh, the movie Seven Up, 14 Up, 21 Up. So they followed these kids, now they're 50 cents. So they, they took this huge group of people and they followed them through the years. So this is the same kind of study. So they identified 17,000 people born in England, Scotland, and Wales in a single week in 1970. And they've studied them since that time. And every 10 years or so they do a new, new analysis. The latest analysis establishes that reading in youth has the most explanatory impact on future educational attainment, job and life satisfaction, and social mobility, in part because reading actually, quote, increased cognitive progress over time. They found that this was much more significant than parents' education or socioeconomic status. Now, if you know educational research, that just blew your mind. Your socks are falling off. Because I've never seen a study before that has found anything else other than the parents' educational attainment and socioeconomic status as the most explanatory factor. This said, reading in youth is much more explanatory. That means this is so right. If you want more social mobility, if you want more happiness, if you want more satisfaction, if you want more cognitive progress, the way to get it, the great equalizer, is time spent reading and proficiency in reading. So, I mean, this puts a whole new edge on what we do. I just got back from Germany. I spent a semester teaching in the Otto Hahn Wissenschaft Academy, so a science magnet school. Uh, about 25% of the kids were refugees. Anwar, who's to my right, is a Syrian refugee. He's learning German as a fifth language and English as a sixth language. Saeed, who's sitting in the front has it easier, she's learning German as a fourth language and English as a fifth language. And 25% of kids in this class are learning German as a foreign language and English as a foreign language. Uh, I have to say it's such a great time, but it really focuses the challenges. Germany, by the way, <coughs> has such a great attitude, officially, uh, on the government level, uh, about, about refugees. You know, Angela Merkel, who is their, uh, the Bundes Chancellor, you know, the Bundes Chancellor, she, she says over and over again, I mean weekly, she's in the news saying this, we need these people as much as they need us. This is a reciprocal arrangement, and it is our moral responsibility. It is our historical responsibility as Germans, which I love that they're talking about that. It is our historical responsibility, uh, and we have, we're supposed to do this in school. And it is our functional, uh, practical solution to our culture's problems. We need these people to come and to be productive, reciprocal members of our society. We need them. And that's the attitude, and that's the attitude in school, which is a, a, a really refreshing, wonderful attitude. There's no talks about walls. Um, so, what we did in this class, I, I was teaching 8th grade and 11th grade in both classes, we were just trying to create a cultural literacy. You know, where every day, the 8th grade students, the 11th grade students were engaged in multiple levels of inquiry. So they were learning the English language and speaking, listening, reading and composing in English, sometimes as a 4th or 5th or 6th language, every day. And they were doing it through inquiry that connected current events like the refugee crisis. So we directly studied these things. By the way, Michelle Fine, who's a, a professor in New York City, she's a big proponent of this. She goes, directly address the issues most impacting the kids. You know, other people like Dorothy Heath kind of argued, go through the back door. I really like this front door approach. We would just get after it. We would inquire into the problems, 
facing the kids and the culture in immediate ways. And we were reading literature and nonfiction uh, that connected their personal lived experience. And so the inquiry required continual reading, writing, speaking, and listening. And as we did this, we were inquiring into expert reading. Now, when you do this kind of inquiry, you need everybody. John Dewey was very clear, democracy and education. He said, democracy is not everybody doing the same thing. He said, democracy is complementarity. It is people bringing their unique perspective, their unique background, and their unique interest to bear on a common project. And one of the things we studied was, how can we best navigate struggle? And we talked a lot about the refugee crisis and the problems of people coming into a new country, uh, both for the country but for themselves. And we needed everybody to do it. We needed everybody's perspective, and we achieved that complementarity. Now, I want to be clear that I'm talking today about inquiry as cognitive apprenticeship. So inquiry is a term that gets bandied about quite a bit. And in some meta-analyses, like John Hattie's, uh, inquiry is rated kind of in a middling place. That's because they're talking about inquiry as conflated with discovery learning. I'm not talking about that. I am talking about inquiry as cognitive apprenticeship. And when you look at reviews of research, like George Hillock's in Language Arts, Hillock's concluded that review, which is considered the seminal review, by saying, reading and writing are forms of inquiry best taught and best learned in context of inquiry, period. So you can see he left no wiggle on there. When you look at the Fred Newman studies, which are considered to be the gold standard studies of teaching treatment, he found the same thing. Kids who learn in context of inquiry as cognitive apprenticeship scored about a stain on a hunter on any kind of standardized task. I mean, that's profound. And he found that they maintained their gains when the follow-up studies were done. They were more motivated to read, write, learn, do science in whatever domain they learned the inquiry. By the way, right now my project is teaching science teachers how to do real-world science with kids. So to do actual scientific research. We're doing research in the water with elementary school kids, middle school kids, and the National Science Foundation is using the data because they have a dearth of water research nationwide. So the kids are actually contributing and, and to you know, a real scientific database, and that is highly motivating for them. And they're learning how to do science. <laughs> oh, how I wish I had been taught this way. I feel another riff coming on. So, <laughs> when I was in eighth grade, I had Mrs. Martha McCoy for eighth grade science. And we were learning about astronomy and science. And I was made to memorize the nine planets. And there was uh, a mnemonic, my very earthy mother, blah, 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 pizza, right? <laughs> now, now, people my age are very angry because there's no more pizza. <laughs> now, notice how this is tied up with power relations in the classroom. It's tied up with teaching and learning theories. She had a theory of information transmission, teacher-centered, curriculum-centered teaching. She believed and expressed to us that we had no part in making science or doing science we didn't know enough. In fact, scientific knowledge was handed down from God to Moses, put into the stone tablets and textbooks, and she was giving it to right us. That, that teaching and learning theory dominates American education to this day. Although all the next generation standards express a different theory. If you look at the Common Core State Standards, they're all procedures, they're all strategies. There's a new sheriff at times. Basically there's been a recognition, which we've known in cognitive science for a long time, that it's procedures that are transferable. And that procedures are best learned in context of use. And that if you teach kids how, they're going to have to learn the what. John Dewey found that in the Chicago Lamb School. That if you gave the kids information-driven teaching, they could get 100% of the test and have understood nothing. And two weeks later, they usually get a zero on the same test because they remember nothing. But when you taught the kids through cognitive apprenticeship, they learned the basic procedures, they learned the basic uh, purposes, but they also learned the content. Because as Dewey said, you can't learn the how without learning some what. 
because you can't think scientifically without scientific facts. You can't do math without math facts. You can't do a historical argument unless you know some history. But it's the why and the how that is motivating, that leads to confidence, and that is transferable. So, George Hillock said, teaching is a transitive verb. And he says, because he's an English guy, that means it takes both a direct and an indirect object. Which means you teach something to somebody, or somebody something. So you're teaching specific human beings how to read. And he said, and don't forget the specific human being, because if you do, you're not teaching. He's proposing a very different model of teaching and learning called cognitive friction. That your job is to share the power with the kids. And in fact, give it over to them. You apprentice them through gradual release of responsibility to know what experts know, and then to do what experts do, and then to go beyond. And start using and tweaking and revising those expert strategies on their own. Hillmax also famously said, what is learned must be taught. So he's against this inquiry as discovery. He's saying, if you learned something, it was taught to you. Maybe by the environment, maybe by your peers, maybe by the teacher, but that anything that is learned must be taught. And Hillmax would say, science is not out there waiting to be discovered. You can't unearth it. It's a human construction. You must be inducted and apprenticed into it. And once you are inducted and apprenticed into it, then you can help to transform it from the inside. But you got to know the rules of the game. Now, the more marginalized your kids, the more important this is. That you're explicit about the rules of the game. That doesn't mean you have to agree with them. It doesn't mean you don't work to change them. But you have to know the game that you're participating in. Now, what I'm going to focus on now, now we're going to get a little more practical, is about nonfiction. So this comes from a study where we studied the expert reading of teachers in the disciplines. So we found out what they did when they approached complex nonfiction. Then we studied their students and found that they weren't doing any of the same things. And so then we did an intervention study giving them focused, deliberate practice in what the experts did, and the results were fantastic. You know, it was one kid said, why did no one teach us this before? It was like the scales being lifted from their eyes. And it was also very revelatory and transformative for the teachers because it, it changed their theories. See, they changed their practices and then it changed their theories. And it moved them to a growth mindset. It moved them more to a cognitive apprenticeship approach. So I'm going to talk briefly about what expert readers do. And I'm going to talk about two tools that we use. One is a heuristic for what you've got to notice which are topics, key details, genres, and text structures. And then another is four rules of notice. Rules of notice for topics, rules of notice for, well, actually the four rules of notice are direct statements, calls to attention, ruptures, and reader response. We found if kids learn those four sets of rules, it helped them notice topics or general subjects of text, notice key details, and notice how they were structured and patterned for meaning and effect. So these two sets of rules we found to be very transformative for the kids. And then I'm going to share for you uh, a sequence to teaching these things to kids. So I'm content that our job as teachers is to make public those secret things that expert readers know and do. Because a lot of times we just assign and evaluate and we don't take off the top of our heads. We don't share what it is that expert readers know and do. And yet that's what the new standards are asking us to do. That's what's transferable. That's what's immediately usable. Um, and then we need to assist and support students in taking on those same strategies and stances. And we need to assure them they're going to get help they need to achieve these things because they're foundational. They're what, called, what is called in cognitive science threshold knowledge. It passes you through a threshold. It means you're going to regard reading differently for the rest of your life. And you're going to have generative ways of improving your reading throughout a lifetime. The more non-mainstream, marginalized, or damaged the learner identity, the more important it is to recruit the cultural resources of the learner. Amelia was talking about this. The kids come to our classroom with funds of knowledge. Those are in no way obstacles. Those are resources. 
Jerry Chillack said, all new learning is based on the already known. And if you do not recruit the already known, you have no resources to teach the new. So that's especially, it's important with every kid, but especially with anybody who is struggling in any way. The more non-mainstream the kids are, the more marginalized or damaged the learning identity, the more important it is to engage in explicit, situated teaching. So where you're being very explicit and modeling and mentoring and monitoring the kids' work in actual context of use. Not on worksheets, but in actual reading, in actual writing, in actual inquiry that they could do something about. And it's more important to embrace and express the growth mindset. Again, that's that attitude Carol Pweck writes about that everybody can and will learn if they practice and put in the effort with expert strategies. They can and will learn. And if you've not read her book, uh, Mindsets, please do. It'll totally compel you that this is absolutely the case. One of the ways I try to do this in my own classroom is I provide what's called procedural feedback. So this is where you explicitly describe what an author has done or a student has done when they're reading and writing, and then the meaning effect. So it creates this agentive attitude. Readers and writers do things that make meaning. And you did this thing, and it made this kind of meaning and had this kind of effect. The author did, made these moves, and it had this kind of meaning and effect. And I wonder what would happen if you move forward in this way. By the way, we have found that when we give kids a way forward, unless they're in 12th grade English, they take up the invitation. <laughs> it, it, it's astonishing. So the most reluctant kids, if you give them a way forward, they go, yeah. So let me give you an example. Uh, I was in a classroom a couple weeks ago. Uh, we're, we were writing poems. And this kid, Joe, was refusing to write the poem. And I go, Joe, why are you writing the poem? He goes, because I suck at poetry. <laughs> now that's a fixed mindset, right? <laughs> and I go, what makes you think you suck at poetry? Because guaranteed, the teacher who I work closely with did not write on his poem, you suck at poetry. <laughs> she didn't know, right? So he goes, well, and he tells me this long start. You know, we wrote arguments uh, in, in the last unit, and, uh, you know, Ms. Baker, she told me that I was awesome at writing arguments. That's fixed mindset. That you're just good at something or just bad at something. And I go, well, why'd she say you were good? He goes, I don't know. And I go, well, why do you think you're bad? He goes, because, look, she, she just wrote a rat all over it. Now, what would have happened if the teacher on the argument had said, Joe, the way you have a debatable and defensible claim shows you ran a PMI on your claim. Excellent effort. The way you used a variety of evidence from a variety of sources shows that you ran a semantic scale on your evidence. Excellent. Then she's reinforcing all the strategies she's teaching. And she's attributing his success not to he's good at it, but he put in the effort using the strategies. Then when he writes the poem, she could have said, Joe, the way you compared your anxiety before the football game to the squirrel really worked for me because this is all true. <laughs> because, you know, squirrels are always running around and seem nervous and that work. But when you changed to the hedgehog, I did not follow you. <laughs> and I wonder what might happen if you stuck with the squirrel throughout the poem. And I did that, and guess what he did? He immediately started writing again. Because he had a way forward. That's what kids need. The way forward. They need to be shown the path. So this growth mindset is huge. I studied with Gloria Lanson Billings when I was at the University of Wisconsin back in the day, and she is the person who came up with the idea of culturally relevant pedagogy. And she argued we must make teaching and learning relevant and responsive to the languages, literacies, and cultural practices of students across categories of difference and inequality. I'm not claiming to be great at this, but it is a goal. And I'm gonna show you in this instructional sequence how I'm trying to do that. A re more recent trend, Django Paris is the person who writes a lot about this, is culturally sustaining pedagogy, which he argues includes all of the features of culturally relevant pedagogy and goes beyond it. So he argues we need instruction that supports the value of our multi-ethnic and multilingual present and future. Culturally sustaining pedagogy seeks to perpetuate and foster, to sustain linguistic, literate, and cultural pluralism as part of the democratic project of schooling. Now, it's very interesting to me, having taught in Germany, having taught in Australia, having taught in Canada, 
that they have way different metaphors for culture than we do. So our culture, cultural metaphor, is the melting pot. Come over, lose your distinctive features of your culture, and become one of us. In Canada and in Germany, the metaphor is the great mosaic. That's very different. Come, keep and retain your cultural background, your language, your literacy. The diversity brings strength and beauty to the mosaic of our country. And actually, they have political processes and ways to make sure that different groups are represented. So it's a very different kind of model and one that I would embrace. So let's move on to reading complex nonfiction. So here's the thing. Monitor your own reading. You pick up the newspaper this morning. You're flipping the headlines. What do you choose to read? Stop you're interested in and already know something about. In school, kids often don't have that luxury. So I'm arguing that when they are learning about something new, you have to give them strategies for doing that. And then, once you've gone through a sequence of instruction, your goal should be now read some stuff on your own that you can bring back to the whole class. So I'm going to argue to do some things together to learn new strategies and then give kids some independence and then ask them to come back and teach the other kids about what they read. So it's like being dropped in unfamiliar terrain. So when you're in unfamiliar terrain, what do you got to do? You got to get oriented in terms of the big picture. And you got to pay attention to the details of the immediate situation. So what we found was that when teachers were reading disciplinary area text, they first tried to notice what we end up calling the conversation. If you're reading the newspaper, you and you look at one article, you're entering into a conversation. That conversation's been going on a long time. You're expected to know what's the conversation about, what turn is this article taking in that conversation, and then you're asked to say how you feel about that. So to take a prosaic example, you might have heard that Chicago Cubs are in the World Series for the first time since 1945. That's, if you're a Cub fan, that's been an ongoing conversation for a long time. <laughs> and, and, you know, and really the big conversation is what determines who wins, right? And why have the Cubs been so terrible for so long? The level of losing. And what's different now? And will they be able to fall through, come through, or will their history be an impediment? Right? So it's this ongoing conversation. And you're supposed to know about that 108 year long conversation. If you look at the front page, you know, today I see your attorney general in Pennsylvania has been indicted and, in fact, now is going to be sentenced. She's sentenced, right? So this is about a question of what is fair, right? And who is above the law? And how do we control that? It's an ongoing cultural conversation. I won't even refer to the election. But those issues are ongoing cultural conversations about who is fit to be president, what disqualifies you to be president, right? It's an ongoing cultural conversation we have had for many, many years. So you've got to notice the conversation. You have to notice key details to notice the conversation. But once you notice the conversation, it helps you notice key details and what is key. So they work reciprocally together. Likewise, you've got to notice the genre or the big superstructure, because that's a roadmap. When you know, ah, this is a narrative, or oh, this is a definition, oh, this is a Dear John letter, whatever. Now you know how it's going to begin, how it's going to continue, and how it's going to end. You've already, you've already been put into the game, and it's going to help you. And one of the most difficult things about nonfiction text is it embeds text structures. So if you read an argument, it's going to embed comparison contrast, it's going to embed narrative, it's going to embed definition of terms. And kids often don't notice a new text structure is being introduced, and they don't know how to read that text structure. So those two things work reciprocally as well. Here's another thing I want my kids to know, that reading is a transaction, and it's a conventional transaction. It's a contract. What do I mean by that? I mean that everything you read was written by somebody who's trying to manipulate you. 
They want you to know, believe, or do something. And you better think, who was this person, and what are they doing to manipulate me, and do I want to go along? You know, that's called critical reading. And I tell them, authors use moves or conventions. They, they're coding their text with what we're calling rules of notice. That's a call that you're supposed to notice to say, and you're supposed to interpret it in a conventional way. And I tell my students, I don't care what you think of the text, or if you like the text, until you tell me what it means. Let me give you an example. If we were having a political discussion, and I interrupted you and said, that is the stupidest thing I ever heard, and here's what you should think. You would go, wow, Jeff is a jerk. And you'd be right. And yet we let kids do that all the time with text. I said, no, there was an author who wrote this, and they worked really hard on writing it. So, tell me what the author meant. So, if we're having our political discussion, and I said, Mario, explain that again to me. Now, let me mirror back. Did I get that right? Now, what if I asked you this question? And after I worked really hard to understand Mario the way he wanted to be understood, I said, Mario, i got to respectfully disagree on these grounds. He'd be okay. And I tell kids, that's what you got to do with the text. you got to understand how it was structured for meaning and effect. <laughs> then you're allowed to say what you liked and didn't like. Then you're allowed to say whether you agreed or disagreed. But you got to understand the text before you do that. Otherwise, you're just looking in the mirror. You're not learning from your reading, either in terms of content or in terms of strategy. Now, I've mentioned these rules of notice. Explicit announcements or direct statements, calls to attention, and ruptures or surprises. And then there's another one, rules of the reader's response. So when you get a sense of intense agreement or disagreement, or something gives you an emotional charge, that reveals something about the text, but it also reveals something about you. So these are the four rules we taught the kids. So to summarize, this is what our research found. Expert readers read along a two by two matrix. They read from topics and key details, relate and inform each other to make a comment about the topic. And they read from genre and text structures interplay to structure and pattern the key details about the topics for meaning and effect. If you know the Common Core State Standards or any of the other states who have next generation standards, they talk about all these things. It's widely recognized. This is part of expert reading. And yet rarely do we do anything to assist the kids to do this kind of work. So in my new book about this, we have a sequence in which the kids get, or get the practice to enact these principles and develop the expertise. They do the work together, then they practice these strategies with small groups and free choice reading. Because these strategies are threshold knowledge. They are things you can develop throughout a lifetime. By the way, here's Yoda. Uh, this is outside my school. It says, much to read, young Padawan, you still have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so I said to him, your reward for doing so well and learning these new strategies is you get to do it again in your own reading. Because <laughs> that's the point, right? That you transfer, that you start using it in your own reading. So we're going to go top down and bottom up uh, to learn about how topics and key details and also to a degree text structure and genre work together. Now this is an idea from linguistics. It's called the topic comment strategy. I have found this to be revolutionary with my kids. By the way, the last three names have shown the same finding. Fewer than 6% of our graduating high school seniors can tell you the main idea of an extended text and justify it with evidence from throughout the text. They are very good, over 90% proficiency at literal decoding. Now, let's put that in plain English. Kids can repeat what's directly stated in a text, but they can't think with or about a text. In a democracy, that's quite worrisome. If I was in Canada, I might be talking about a wall. You know, because if only 6% of our graduate seniors can do that, that means they're not prepared for democracy, right? So, the topic comment strategy solves this problem. And research out of the Ontario Institute of Studies and Education has shown that kindergartners can do this if they have an instructional partner prompting them. So it's not a question of capacity, it's a question of knowing the strategy. So, what I do to use this strategy is I start with visual text. So one of the units I'm doing now is what does it mean to be an American? You know, that's a cultural conversation. That's a cultural debate. 
by refugee and immigrant students are very interested in this. And so one of the things we looked at look at is American sports. So I might give them a collage like this. Now notice, you don't need English to look at the collage. Everybody can participate. I have my kids sitting in quads, so they're going to hear what other people are saying and identifying, and they're going to learn the language to do this. And I'll say something to them, huh, what do all five pictures have in common? The through line of key details is what's called the conversational topic. And what do my students typically say? Sports. Yeah, so I'm a sports. Is every one of these pictures about a sport? Great, so we've done a gut check, and yes, it's a through line, so we could call it the topic. But the best possible topic, the one that most powerfully guides your reading, is the most specific one. So let's try to make it more specific. Could I say aerobic sports? Why not? Sorry, golfers, it's not a road sport, particularly if you drive that little car around. <laughs> now, what I'm trying to point out to the kids are the errors they often make. Sometimes kids will choose a topic, but it doesn't accommodate all the key details. That's not the most robust topic. So I'm trying to point this out to them. Why couldn't I say games? Oh, swimming's not a game. Plus, when you tell somebody the topic, they should be visualizing what's in the picture or the text. And you might be visualizing Parcheesi or chess, device of games. How about competitive sports? Is everyone one of those a competitive sport? So that's more specific. Now, I tell the kids this. Every text, even as simple as a collage or a list, has multiple topics. This is one of many reasons that standardized tests are stupid. <laughs> because they say, what is the topic of the text? And they give you a multiple guess or a mystical choice. And you're playing guess what the test maker thought. Mm -hmm. And if you guess right, you get it right. And if you guess wrong, you get it wrong. And they never ask the kids, why do you think it's the topic? What's the through line of key details? So competitive sports is one topic. But let's stick with that. Now the comment would be competitive sports are or require or whatever. So you have competitive sports as your noun phrase, and then you're going to give a verb phrase. And then you gotta go back to the text and say, and this is how the text, the details in the text, support my verb phrase. So at your table, I want you to brainstorm for 30 seconds. What would be a possible topic comment? Don't freak out. There are many possible answers. All you gotta do is say, look at the through line. All of these pictures support our topic comment that competitive parts are, or require, or demand, or whatever your verb phrase is. 30 seconds, go. So as I say to my middle schoolers, stop learning and listen to me. Which is pretty much true, right? Now, I would give them more time, but I heard you talk about the same things they would talk about, which are very profound cognitive skills. By the way, I have college students who don't know the difference between a topic and a theme. That means they can't read from an idea. You know, you'll say, what is the topic of Romeo and Juliet? They go, love sucks! <laughs> I know that would be a thing. <laughs> and actually, love's too general. You know, so they need help with this as well. Who's got a topic comment that you're willing to share? Yes? Holy cow! So, these people are on fire! They give us a five-pronged topic comment! Now, let me give some procedural feedback. The way you started with the topic means I know the general subject that the artist is commenting on. And then the way that you listed, it was in the four or five ideas, show that you understand how texts make comments about the topic. Here's something else you did, which was amazing and fantastic. Uh, you figured forth from the pictures. So when, what was your first comment? That they required dedication or? Yeah, they have to have dedication if they're going to be working. Okay, notice. Dedication is not in the picture. She knows from her life experience that you just can't go out there and jump in the pool and swim. <laughs> you can't go out there in the golf course the first time and put that little ball in that little hole. She knows. Her group knows. Now, this is a point I want to make to my kids about reading being a transaction. 
The research is clear about this. The more kids struggle with reading, the more they're in remedial programs, the more they think reading is decoding words. Here's one of my favorite stories about this. I was teaching a kid named Marvin, seventh grade reader, he's in the Wilson phonics method. I got nothing against phonics, kids need to know phonics, but if it's decontextualized from real reading, this is what happens. He reads a sentence, he slid into second and cocked his knee. <laughs> seventh grade, I go, Marvin, what's a knee? He says, I don't know, I only read what it says. <laughs> That's information driven teaching. That's not apprenticeship. If you're being apprenticed in expert reading, you go, if it doesn't make sense, go back and think about it again. Right? You, you have these monitoring strategies. <laughs> so a little later in the, um, the story, there's a play home play. And it just says, out, in quotes. And I go, who called him out? He goes, I don't know. It doesn't say. I go, Marvin, you play baseball. Who calls people stay around? He goes, the umpire. But it doesn't say who's doing it here. <laughs> he was a bad boy. He goes, and I thought he was going to say, I'm telling you everything it says. It's not fair to you to ask me what it doesn't say. <laughs> he needs some threshold knowledge. And the threshold knowledge he needs is readings a transaction. And you do half the work. And if it's about baseball, the author expects you to bring all your knowledge about baseball. And he expects you, as it just says out, that you know the umpire was the one doing it. When you, when kids get that, they have a totally new way of regarding reading. And a lot of the most struggling readers do not regard reading that way. They don't understand. They're being asked to do half the work. They're being asked to bring their background. There are a lot of different answers. And what makes, there's a lot of wrong answers too. But there's a lot of potentially justifiable valid answers if you can go back to the text and justify how your topic comment is expressed by all the details working together. My, I have students who are very resistant. I do not want them resisting reading. I want them to resist me, maybe. So what did you think, Dr. Well? Did you think of that? No. And oftentimes, I didn't. So that's a way to resist, to say, I, I think ours is better than theirs. And here's why, you know? And then they can make, make their resistance part of the natural part of the classroom. That you might resist the author, or you might resist the standard interpretation. A collage is a genre. It's organized to express meaning in a particular way. I start showing the kids shape genres. And then I say, huh, the shape is now part of what you're supposed to notice and how you're supposed to interpret. And the kids will come up with these. And in fact, the kids often make them toward the end of the unit. Uh, one of the units that we actually just finished is an identity unit, What Makes Me Me. And one of my students did this. It's called Mirror, Mirror. So the title is a direct statement. So it is a call to attention. You've got to notice titles. It's also a literary illusion. Anybody recognize it? Yeah, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of the wall? So now we're tipped off what, up to the conversational topic. Literary illusions, illusions to historical events, are something you're supposed to notice. It's called a call to attention. I'd like you to turn to your table. What are some other things you know she wants you to notice about this text? 30 seconds, go. We've got a blue line for repetition. Repetitions are a call to attention. They're cultural norms of beauty, or a particular cultural norm of beauty. What's up else? And we know she wants us to notice that because it's such a repetition and it surrounds everything. So it's got a privileged position, it's the frame, and it's repeated. Now notice what I'm doing with the kids. I don't lecture about rules of notice. We just start with pictures, and then I go, notice what you did! And then we start making anchor charts, and the kids are making the anchor charts. And I tell the kids, who's doing the work? And they go, we are. Well, of course, I'm working too, but I tell them, the people doing the work are the ones learning. You know, John Goodland has this famous quote where he says, school is a place where young people go to watch old people work. <laughs> I tell my students, I already passed seventh grade. Now it's your turn. My job is to get you to do the work that's necessary. So you're doing the work, and I just name it. And then you do the anchor chart. Ah, you're supposed to notice her expression, right? You're, that's a rule of notice of my characters. It's a call to attention. So it's notice expressions, so it's notice body gestures. So we can have a whole anchor chart about what to notice about character. That's going to help you in any kind of text, fictional or non-fictional, throughout your life. Who's got something else for social notice? Yes? Well, in addition to her looking sad in the mirror, all the images around her look happy. 
This is called a rupture, a rule of rupture. Whenever there's a shift or an asymmetry, there's, there's a couple asymmetries here. These are photographs this she drew. She was a Hispanic girl, by the way, so she's doing a critique here of mainstream notions of beauty. Uh, so the fact that she uses a different media as a rupture, her expression, in, and notice what we have here, a text structure, comparison contrast, for meaning and effect. So now I'm getting to talk a little bit about that. You know, we have a portrait, that's a collage, it's using a text structure in comparison, using media and different attitudes and different uh, kind of emotional valences. Anything else we're supposed to notice? What do you got, Mari? Looks like she put a lot of makeup on her. She could have just drawn her face. Now that's something you're supposed to notice. It, that's a call to attention. In fact, there's kind of a, the makeup didn't come on, go on all that well, right? No. It's not what it's supposed to look like, so that's a rupture. Now we could go on, but notice, you're noticing a lot of stuff. And we have named, not just the rules of why to notice this, but rules to notice anything in any text, written or visual throughout your life. And we put them on the anchor chart. Now, what I, let's just say that the topic here is cultural norms of beauty, but you can change that if you want. Mainstream notions of beauty, whatever. And now I want you to talk to your group, what do all those things we noticed working together? Oh, and by the way, you can't see this, but on the frame of the mirror, it says mirror, mirror, on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? So you're supposed to notice that too. Uh, I want you to talk at your table, what's a potential topic comment? Don't freak out. There's many possible topic comments. Just make sure you can go back and say how to accommodate the major details. I'll give you one minute because it's hard. Good luck, go. What we're learning really is threshold knowledge. Ways of reading you can apply throughout your lifetime. But we're also learning stuff about identity, concepts about identity. But we're also learning how those things affect us personally because throughout, the kids are not just reading, they're using the tools about reading to compose. And when they do that, they're sharing themselves. They're sharing their story. This is called a now and then. Uh, this is one of my refugee students talking about his journey to America. You know, and then the kids are sharing their stories. They're becoming complementary to the inquiry, what makes me me? If you want to know me, what are you going to know about me? What do you got to understand about me? Uh, everybody's getting to tell their stories. And if the kid's English is, uh, you know, striving, he can show a picture. And other kids can say what they got out of it. Or sometimes my kids will put on the back what they want to say as they present it. You know, they can rehearse that. Oh, I, I feel another riff coming up. So, so last year, right before I went to Germany, I was teaching Romeo and Juliet. I had three Bosnian boys and three Somali girls who were pretty much, you know, new to America. And, um, and what we were doing was we were looking at songs in this way. Uh, so I said, bring your favorite love song and tell what it expresses about love. And then you got to justify, do a little micro argument. So the two Somali girls come up to me and they say, can we sing our promise songs? So before I can ask, one of the girls says, what's a promise song? And they go, oh, these, these are two girls in full burkas. And they go, oh, that's the song you sing to your fiance when you, and they had to help her, get engaged. And they go, yes. And, and everybody goes, well, you're engaged. And they go, oh yes, since we were 12. And the kids go, well, do you like him? <laughs> and, and the girls go, we've never met him. But you sang him this promise of, oh, you go to his window, but you can't see him. And, and the kids go nuts. And I go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Uh, some of the research I've read shows that arranged marriages are much happier and much more successful. <laughs> so your mom ought to be choosing your wife. <laughs> now notice what happened. Instead of being marginalized, instead of not being really part of the classroom project but being tangential, they're essential because they know stuff. Nobody else knows about our inquiry. What makes and breaks relationships, right? They, they've got different attitudes. And, and the kids, they became go-to people, right? So they, they come in, they sing their promise songs, which are in these tribal languages. They have to translate into English. That's in their zone of proximal development. It's helping them learn English. They're, it's a, they're beautiful. The girls wrote them themselves. They're poetic. They, they express these cultural attitudes, which are different 
from mainstream American attitudes. And they became go-to people throughout the whole region. So then what we did is we read the graphic novel version of Romeo and Juliet, because you can get these, it can be in simple English, uh, modern English, or Shakespearean English. And I, I have them all, and I go, choose the one you want. Well, you know, the kids sort of struggle. You could basically, and the pictures are the same in all three, so it looks the same. But you can tell the story pretty much from the pictures, and the pictures help you learn the language. So it's in their zone of proximal development. So the Bosnia boys come up to me, they're very excited after they read it, and they go, Dr. William, Mister, Mister. That's like going, Mister, Mister. There's Bosnia, Romeo, and Juliet. And I go, really? And I thought they were in a folk town. I go, can you find it? Yes, we find it. You know, I go, great. And you gotta, you gotta share with the rest of the class. Well, they come in, they've got two news stories in Bosnia. Okay. I go, guys, gotta help me out, right? So they translate for me. The first story, Muslim Christian couple, both families disapprove of their relationship, they jump off a bridge committing double suicide. That's Romeo and Juliet. I said, everybody's got to know the story. So I taught them a technique called uh, Tableau. They had to figure out one of the six major scenes. How do we tell the whole story? They learn the story structure. How do we show the character, the roles of notice? Um, and, they gave, and they rehearsed and they gave this presentation class. It's in their zone of proximal development. And it was necessary to our inquiry. If you ask, you know, if I say to my kids, we're going to read Romeo and Juliet, which I love, I love Romeo and Juliet. I have yet to have a kid jump up and do the woo-woo dance. <laughs> that is never happened. I've never had a kid go, woo-hoo, I've been waiting for this. That's never happened. <laughs> but if I say to the kids, we are going to study what screws up relationships, they all look at each other. Because have you ever met eighth or ninth graders for whom that is not the central problem? <laughs> right? So now it's about them. Now you're not reading Romeo and Juliet because it's something to do for school. You're reading Romeo and Juliet to do something that matters to you. And I teach them the strategies they need in that context. Nobody was ever motivated by strategies. But kids will learn really complicated strategies if they're doing something interesting. And then they get psyched about the strategies as they see how they're getting more competent and they can name what they're doing. If you ask that question, what screws up relationships of the first act of Romeo and Juliet? What answers do you get? Parental interference. I wonder if that's still happening today. Familial or gang affiliation. Could that still be happening today? Religion is a big one, which the Bosnian boys told us about, right? Uh, you could even argue cultural difference, which the Somali girls talked about. I mean, it's, it goes on and on, and every answer you get is still true for all the kids today. And everybody in the class has different experiences with it and can talk about it. So it's their story that becomes important. So then you move on to more complicated text. So I might show them a great painting. I have used this both in what does it mean to be an American and what screws up relationships. <laughs> So, you know, this is a very iconic American painting. American Gothic is its title. Now, I say this to you. American Gothic. The title is always something to notice. It's a call to attention in any text. It should start to activate some background. Now, I looked up the definition of Gothic. And I tell the kids, and I'll share it with you for free. <laughs> the first definition is type or archetype. So he's also making a direct statement. These are American types. They are American icons. The second definition was the dark underside of the story. This is another rule of notice. It's another call to attention. If there's a double meaning, the author or artist is going to play on the double meaning. So he's asking us, what's the dark underside of the story? And the kids get very interested. <laughs> and the third meaning is the style of architecture. That's called American Gothic architecture, where you have the church window in the gable. What I want you to do is turn your partners, one minute, what are the things you know Grant Wood wants us to notice, and how do you know to notice those things? Now, who's doing the work? You. But I'm going to give you procedural feedback. How do you know to notice that? It's front and center. It's got a privileged position. And I start making the connection to text, that the introduction is privileged information. The conclusion is privileged information. Any shift or climax is privileged information. Those are privileged positions. Here's another thing about the pitchfork. It's repeated. 
and repeat it with a twist in the church window. Here's another thing. He's holding it. What does the pitchfork mean to, to us in America? It can mean work. It can mean power. And if you want to do a religious thing, it's the devil, the enemy of man. And now you can start doing comparisons. What's going on down here versus up there? What's something else you got to notice? You've got to notice their expressions. That's a call to attention about characters. Here's something else you got to notice. What is it? When you're looking at the characters. Now, he's got a dress coat over his work clothes. You're supposed to figure out why. That's a rupture. What's, what's happening as soon as the paintings are? Yeah, he's going to the bar. She's got her <laughs> over her work clothes. And she's going up here where you see gardening tools and household plants. What's something else you notice about the characters? He's piercing. <laughs> she's behind him. And she's looking askance. Now, if we had time, I would say, what do you think is the topic? And the kids usually say relationships, marriage, gender roles, farm life. And I go, yeah, it's about all those things. Choose one. What's the topic comes? I'll say, relationships are a hard go. Or farms take a lot of hard work. Or in gender roles, the woman really has a bad. Or whatever, you know? And then I go, what makes you say so? And they got to look at the comparison contrast. This is her world. That's his world. You know, they talk about the role of religion. You know, and they, and they accommodate all the details. Now, what are they doing? Practicing, 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 <coughs> practicing with threshold knowledge. And I tell them, this is going to help you anytime you read anything throughout the rest of your life, whether it's visual, a YouTube video, or a written text. And if I had had time, I, I was going to take you through some of these... Uh, <coughs> You know, parodies? <laughs> change the detail, you've changed the topic, you've changed the comment. And that shows them that you got to pay attention to all the details, to all the patterning, because it changes everything. <laughs> you've just changed the topic, and the topic coming. Speak of idealized motions of beauty. Civil rights photographs play off of it. Here's one. Who's the real American couple? The American type. And then... You start bringing in ones from different cultures. This is the famous, uh, the two Fridas, about how she was conflicted about her Western identity and her indigenous identity. Then the kids start making them and doing them, and we start interpreting them, you know, double portraits, and, and the kids are getting, becoming known, they're practicing the strategies, they're using the rules of notice as writers as well as readers. Then you can move to different things like the introductions and show them how the kids are using these, to, or how authors use them to state not only the conversational topic, but the position you're going to take in it. Um, yeah, anyway. Um, there was so much fun stuff. Gosh, and then uh, it, they can do picture maps, where you picture the topic of a piece, you picture the patterning of key details, and you picture the comment made. Uh, this is from uh, uh, a unit on what is teen health, and the kids read this uh, story. Uh, teen Sue's time. You can see they said it was a comparison contrast structure and it's about all the benefits of getting enough sleep versus all the cost of not getting enough sleep. That's an argument. Uh, this is one for the whole unit. You know, so they've summarized this whole censorship unit uh, and their comment was the whole thing. The First Amendment is tearing the country apart. You know, and the problem's getting worse, not better with the internet. Then the kids find these things out in the uh, on their way to school, direct statement, exit now. Water, it's part of your world, keep it clean, literary illusion. Ruptures, ruptures. And the kids are the ones finding these things. And the point I'm trying to make to them is, it's not, yeah, it's, the point I make to them, you're not doing school here. Anybody uses an advertiser. Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, they're all using these rules of notice to try to manipulate you. Whether it's a poem, or a story, or a political ad, you better pay attention. How is this constructed for meaning effect? Who constructed it for meaning effect? Do I want to go along? And everybody is part of the game. Practice, 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 practice. Buy my book, I get two girls in college. <laughs>